And, and for those who don't know, um, I'm going to be leading tonight's uh, discussion. Um, and I've been in service. And my name is Koshin, for those who don't, don't know. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we'll just start right into um, screen sharing. Um, this evening, uh, I am discussing the, the San Mitsu. Um, and um, before we jump in, into it too much, um, this topic is a discussion um, concerning esoteric practices. Um, and as such is, is not intended and therefore should not be construed as a how-to. Uh, although I do want to relate the, the general concept to our daily lives in a meaningful way. Um, so I hopefully can get that point across. Uh, it is also not what might be found while researching when it relates to ninjutsu um, or ninja. Uh, they often use it as a term for magic. Um, there's too much information out there available that does not relate to how we use Sanmitsu in a Buddhist perspective. Um, and frankly, it's not magic at all, but uh, is often thought to be so. So I hope to make that distinction um, through the discussion tonight. Um, so what is the Sanmitsu? Um, Sanmitsu, or three San secrets or mysteries, Mitsu, uh, is generally um, defined as body, speech, and mind. Uh, body here speaks to one's own form, posture, and physical being doing the practices. But more specifically, the mudras and the sacred hand gestures used in the ritual, um, an esoteric ritual usually. Um, speech is obviously the words being spoken and sounds being made. Uh, the more often refers to the mantra or incantations being used. And mind can refer to the mental state the practitioner takes, uh, a single-minded, uh, focused concentration, uh, usually in the form of visualizations. Uh, therefore, through proper teaching and practice, the aim is to hone and unify these three together to deepen one's practice into the seeing the nature of reality. As these three elements come together, one's entire being becomes involved in what is being done. During an esoteric ritual, for example, a practitioner becomes fully engaged in what they are doing, does not become distracted uh, or diverted from the intention of the ritual. When this focus is then combined with the sacred mudras, mantras, visualizations, uh, each of which invoke a deeper spiritual connection, the sense of self can dissolve and unveil the practitioner's own Buddha nature, and essentially lessening the distinction between themselves and the Buddha or Bodhisattva or deity used in the ritual. This is not to say that the person changes their appearance or in any way magically becomes omnipotent or omnipresent, but that their self slowly takes on the characteristics of the Buddha, Bodhisattva, deity in question. Over time, right, with constant dedicated practice, the practitioner gains wisdom of their own inherent Buddha nature, unveiling those characteristics and allowing that to become what remains, letting go of dukkha, their delusions, discontentedness, ego, etc. <clears throat> so therefore, Sanmitsu is a, is a major principle in um, esoteric Buddhism. Without going into detail about the history and the development of Mahayana esotericism, which be a, it would be a whole other discussion, um, I should note that uh, within the, this form of Buddhism, Dainichi Nyorai, or Mahavaruchana, is the re representation of the Dharmakaya, the, the Dharma body, the ultimate reality, um, Shunyata. And, and here I make a note that I say, I, I refer to Dainichi Nyorai as it, um, for it is genderless, neither and both male and female. Um, furthermore, all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas emanate from it, hence root Buddha, and each manifest as various aspects of the pure Dharma nature, or pure Buddha nature. Buddha of infinite light, Amitabha, Amida Buddha, um, Medicine Buddha, um, Yakshinyorai, Bhashagara Guru, uh, Bodhisattva of compassion, Yakshinyorai, Kanon Bosats, etc. However, we cannot experience this omnipresence of the Buddha uh, and the Dharmakaya in our unawakened state. Um, and therefore, we spend lifetimes of rebirth to be able to hopefully become aware of it. 
Esoteric thought states that we should be able to achieve this within this very lifetime, and that doing so creates a non-dual state of body, speech, and mind of that of Dainichi Nyorai and the practitioner. Within Mahayana Buddhism, Buddha nature um, philosophy states that all beings have the potentiality to become a Buddha. This point is made pl quite plain in the Lotus Sutra and particularly chapter 12 of uh, Devadatta, where spontaneous or sudden awakening is possible in any and all those who hear the Dharma. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> Um, the Buddha nature thought, therefore, implies that we all are able to become awakened, as difficult as it may seem. This, uh, this concept is further elaborated within East Asian Buddhism with the principle of Hongaku, or original inherent awakening, which takes particular importance in Huahan, the Huahian and Cha'an schools, and is a major theme in the Platform Sutra. This then greatly influences the teachings that Saicho and Kukai, founders of Tendai and Shingon respectively, uh, acquire in their trips to China in the end of the 8th century. Therefore, both Hongaku and Sanmitsu concepts play a pivotal role within Tendai and Shingon esoteric Buddhism as being foundational perspectives from which one practices. And within Tendai specifically, Hongaku takes on an expanded viewpoint to incorporate all of nature thus implying that all phenomena, stones, rivers, mountains, are sentient, and as such are expressions of that dharmakaya, the Buddha, shunyata. This does, not, uh, this does imply a distinction between Tendai's esoteric teachings named Tai Mitsu versus Shingon teachings To Mitsu. The former incorporates esoteric, uh, esoteric teachings as a way of practice. The, the latter rem, uh, remains as a single practice approach. This implies that within Tendai, aspects of Sun Mitsu can be found in Nembutsu practice, certain meditations, uh, chanting practices, not only esoteric practices. And if this approach can be utilized in a multitude of different practices, and if Hongaku thought states that the entire phenomenal world is inherently the Buddha, then each moment, each action, each thought, each, every, 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 everything, everything, everything is the Buddha <laughs> as well. Our conduct, what we do, how we do it, are expressions of that same integration into all of nature. A chance to extinguish the self and experience the true nature of reality. At this point, you might be asking, so what? Um, we are not all esoteric practitioners. And thus, use the sun uh, and, and the use of sun mitsu may not make sense in the way that I've described it. It does uh, seem rather extraordinary to be able to become a Buddha in this lifetime, and probably rather pompous to be able to claim as much. Uh, this may be why uh, many see esoteric practices as a gateway for magical powers, or why uh, it may not be conducive for someone who is more ego driven or doing the practices for more personal gain. And as Monshin Sensei always tells me, humans have an infinite capacity for delusion. He says this to me particularly, I don't know why. Um, but conceptually, at least, uh, the sun Mitsu can be very important to our daily lives. So, so what? Well, because uh, if we look at the principles behind sun Mitsu and take the esoteric practices out of it, um, I would argue that we can experience it on a much more mundane level rather routinely. Uh, we might often define mastery in something as a unification of body, speech, and mind. It makes me think of something in particular, um, something um, that musicians often talk about of being in the zone or having such proficiency in a skill that the person no longer has to focus on how and, all, and allows it to come from themselves without the effort or distraction in such a way that they're able to see past the act and can experience the underlying meaning inherent in it. It can gr greatly influence our religious practice. For example, each of these uh, meditation gatherings that we do, we recite the bija, Sanskrit bija, Om Ah Hum, near the end of the service. We can, of course, open our mouth, make a sound, and move on. But uh, if we were to focus in such a way of sitting up straight, filling our lungs fully, drawing down our diaphragm, 
expanding the ribs, then opening our mouth and throat, allowing the sound to come out unencumbered, um, just enough force as to not waste the breath, but enough to use it, to have every ounce of it as a strong, forceful sound, to feel the vibration in our body down in the root, in our dantian, in our pelvic bowl, and up through the head, and visualizing each bija, uh, om, ach, and hum, uh, opening that corresponding chakra. It can strengthen the connection to something that may not be otherwise noticed or experienced. That intention, that concentration, that focus may provide a deeper understanding and a more fulfilling experience. Thus, the Sanmitsu can uh, increase our smirti, or uh, the Buddhist definition of mindfulness, very tangibly, not magically. It, it can set up a, a proper intention. It can clear our mind of discursive thoughts. We can act and, and communicate in such a way that does not mislead or is itself misled. And to comport ourselves in a much more meaningful way. This is not just in our on the cushion, as it were, but in all aspects of our life. Uh, <clears throat> all, <clears throat> excuse me, all of this is to unify body, speech, and mind, to dive deeper into the moment-to-moment -moment aspects of our seemingly overwhelming lives, and with practice and diligence. That veil of me and other, of this and that, and self and Buddha can dissolve. As we go through the Gangyo today, pay closer attention to those portions of the service. Chant a little louder, or be aware of the words being said. Visualize the meditative medicine Buddha as we do the, the mantra. See in your mind's eye the, the transference of merit during Soeko. Be more aware of your posture during meditation and so on. Do what you are doing. Throw yourself into it and whatever it may be and experience what comes out of it. Um, that's all I have for that portion. I will open it up for um, questions, comments and thoughts. Can you help me unmute please? Let's we help folks do that. And if you so choose to unmute, feel free to do so. Have any thoughts or questions? And hopefully, I can hopefully I can respond to some of them. Yes, Mushi. Yeah, it's my understanding that uh, you need to be ordained in order to practice most of the esoteric uh, practices, like mandala practice and, uh, and some of the others. Is it true? Uh, for many portions of esoteric practices, yes. Um, right. and, and so, you know, um, as I... So how is that relevant to the Sangha? Well, <laughs> as I was trying to explain, so in certain aspects, we have certainly during in, in um, retreats and things. Um, for example, last weekend, we did the Ajikan medita meditation, the full moon meditation of, of mm. looking at the Sanskrit Bija Ah. That is very much of a use of Sanmitsu, okay? Um, okay, for example. Um, and so what, what I would say is, for, for example, for you and I learning Goshimbo, we had to be of, of a certain... Um, ordination to learn aspects right. of the mm -hmm. ritual. Yes. And so when it comes to certain esoteric practices, sure. But again, some, some of the, element, the elements of Sanmita as a concept can be applied to um, the practices of the laity um, as well. It's not necessarily strictly, when we talk about things like Goma ritual or things like that, yes, mm -hmm. reserved for, um, for people of um, ordination level. And that's mostly due to the fact that it needs proper training. And then there needs to be a, a inherently a teacher that is um, verbally uh, being a, um, a transmission through a, a connection with a teacher um, needs to be done in a, in a more upright way, if I can describe it that way. Sensei, would you have a... I would just say that, that esoteric means on one level, uh, mudra, mantra, visualization. 
On the other hand, we do many meditations which use mudra, mantra, and visualization. Mm. Whenever you do gasho, that's a mudra. When you are, are doing the om ahum, as he mentioned at the end, that's esoteric, but it's also done by the laity. And we've done mandala meditations on retreats uh, that use the same principles that you would find for those people who are doing it on Hiazan. Does that, does that help? Yes. Any, anything else? Anyone else? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, so thank you very much, Koshin Sensei. Uh, two points. So, um, uh, one is uh, the distinction between Hongaku and Sanmitsu. As I understand, uh, well, I, um, Tendai has two streams, right? Esoteric and exoter exoteric. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one is uh, uh, Shana, right? Shana Go, the other is uh, Shikan. Mm -hmm. And I think in both, we have uh, attempt to coordinating between body, speech, and mind, right? Now, yeah. uh, as for the distinction between Hongak and Samitsu, my understanding, and I would like to hear you, uh, from you uh, in, in, yeah, any comments or from uh, 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 Monsensei as well, I understand that both in, involve uh, transformation. But Hongak, the kind of a transformation I see in Hongak is cognitive, whereas Samitsu, transformation is ontological. In other words, you. In case of Hongaku, you just recognize that each of sentient beings actually has Buddhahood. There is no real transformation in the being, where, rather in the cognition. Whereas in the case of Samitsu, right, um, as, as uh, uh, in Tendai, people use the expression new gaga new. New is uh, entering, ga is self, and self entering. And, what enters to the self is the three secrets or Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. so, so there is an ontological transformation. You really change. So that's how I understood the distinction between the two. And I would like to hear from you about this. That's point number one. Point number two is, right, um, Dainichikyo involves the motif of womb. And I would like to hear from you if you see any relationship between this kind of transformation or spiritual rebirth and womb. Okay, um, so at least for the, the first, um, and again, please chime in. Um, uh, I, I, I can understand how you would see Hongaku as, as purely intellectual. Um, however, you know, I think there is, um, I can think of it intellectually and think, okay, I am surrounded by the Dharmakaya, and, the, and therefore there is uh, all around me this inherent Buddha-ness. Um, and yet intellectualizing and experiencing is very different. And so Sanmitsu is a way to experience, um, but I feel that the experience of Hongaku is still, uh, it, it's still that. It, it's not purely, it's not just the intellect. I can, I can, I can think of the, of the idea that, that inherently all has Buddha nature, um, but the experiential portion of that, that makes it more real, more concrete. Um, and, th and this is where I actually, and, and Sensei will um, hopefully back me up, is, is the idea between belief and faith. So belief is... Belief, um, from my perspective, is the is the thought of saying, "Oh, everything ha is Hongaku. Everything has a Buddha nature," and faith is the experience of that. And so, having experiences that help to prove that to you give you faith. And so, I would have to make a distinction in that respect. Um, in terms of the Sanmitsu, it, it, it is something that is that it, uh, is more done, um, but I, there again. I often use it, and what I'm trying to use it for in the laity perspective, is that it, it, we can intellectualize Sanmitsu as a way to bring it into much more of our daily lives. Whereas if it is purely um, practice oriented, it may be more difficult to, uh, for those who don't practice on a more regular basis 
to do. Um, is that, that's fine. <laughs> um, um, I'm new at this, okay. Um, and, as, and, um, and as for the second point, um, and just please remind me of the, of the main- Dani uh, Yeah, of the womb. Um, you know, I, the womb mandala, for example, um, is very interesting. When, they, when you juxtapose it with the, the Vajra, um, the oh, Kongo Kai, okay. um, for me personally, I always found it very interesting that they're laid out very distinctly different. Whereas Dainichi in the in the um, in the uh, Taizokai, the womb matrix mandala, uh, Dainichi Nora is dead center, and everything comes and is kind of well. It should be seen as a three dimensional object, and um, that there's a conical shape. That that from that everything comes out, and and in that sense, when we think of I, I think of womb or or um, when we are when we are in the womb. We are surrounded by it, and so I always think of the Dharmakaya as like a is is like we're a cosmic soup that we are constantly swimming in, and so in that sense we are fully integrated as part of, and so you know this is where it's very interesting and in how um, where string theory or quantum physics is going we, we, that we are just vibrations as part of that whole um, womb, and so yes they use that as a as an image but as a way to describe um, a pervasiveness that, that, that flows throughout all things, if, I, if that speaks to that. Then. Well, I, I would even go back a little bit further and look at the historical reference and Hongaku comes out of the Tatakata Garba and the Taizukai is the Tatakata Garba mandala. And so Dainichi Nyorai is the root, but from that root, everything flows. Everything flows from Dainichi Nyorai. I don't mean that in a creation monotheistic God concept, but just in the sense that that's the identifiable center from which things um, emanate. And so the, the idea of Hongaku itself comes out of the very basic teachings that are related to Dainichi Nyorai. So I think there is a, re, there is a, a very real relationship between Sanmitsu on one hand, which is body, speech, and mind, which is the unification of the three of those, which is, in fact, would be said that that is the mind of the Buddha, if, if, that's, if that's helpful. I don't, know if, I don't know if I further confused you, Job, or if I no, no, no I, no, I understand where you're coming from, and, uh, and, and, and uh, but I, it seems to me that still a uh, hongaku has to do with, and I, uh, what I meant by cognitive is not just the intellectual, but, but uh, it's kind of a cognitive breakthrough uh, resulted from some kind of transformative experience. Mm -hmm. but, that, but, what, but the, the Buddhahood of uh, the, the sentient, uh, of sentient beings that we begin to recognize uh, always there. Whereas in the case of summits, it seems to me that you really undergo an ontological transformation. Mm -hmm. um, Sagan, I saw that you had your hand up earlier. Sagan and then Mater. And then All right, so my question would have to be more of a practical matter because where I come from in Latin America, right? Explaining Sanmitsu would be a bit complicated to most people. How does Sanmitsu and esoteric Buddhism or esoteric teachings in general, uh, how does it fit into trying to explain Buddhism? How does it fit into the Dharma to people that don't have any contact or any, any experience with ex exoteric Buddhism? and even less esoteric Buddhism? Uh, it, I would certainly say when I, I wouldn't start there. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> I know, I mean... Can I just, yeah, please, please. It's a recognition that some people have the, the blessing to have the time, the energy, and the interest to pursue it. And sometimes esoteric is referred to as a shortcut to awakening. And so for the people who devote themselves to it totally, then it's a very useful practice. 
Another aspect of that, which I think is more relevant for the lay practitioner is that the esoteric practitioner is ultimately not doing it for oneself. The esoteric practitioner is doing it for the benefit of all sentient beings. And so that we now we get into the to the notion of jidiki and tadiki, that argument, uh, which I think everyone is aware of. And so, but that's that gets into that that discussion that the, the jidiki portion of esoteric Buddhism is one is doing it for oneself, one is is involved in that, but there's the tadiki aspect of the esoteric practice in which you're doing it for the other person. You're not you're not doing it with the and you and you're doing it with the aid of the various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and, and other spiritual beings. So I, I think from a, from a Latin American perspective, that may be that may be more explainable. Thank you. Um, Maynard, Maynard, Maynard. Maynard. Um, yes, I you know my initial introduction to Buddhism was through Zen in Japan. And I remember especially being taught that of the limits of the use of words, I guess we can expand that to cognitive approaches. And that, that what you were really trying to achieve in a Zen practice was experiential. And we used to joke that, you know, for a religion that dismissed the value of words and the explanation they certainly produce a lot of literature explaining it <laughs> but um you know you can see this kind of conflict also in other religions uh, i'm not a catholic but my wife is a practicing catholic and uh, so the only churches i ever go into during our marriage are catholic churches and uh, especially when traveling and uh, when traveling, sometimes you have the opportunity to hear a Latin mass uh, with uh, an emphasis on ritual, what my wife refers to in the mass as smells and bells. And uh, there's something transformative about ritual itself, if it's done beautifully. And uh, I don't know if I'm talking about a form of Roman Catholic mikyo. Uh, or it's the same idea, but this, this whole notion of a potential conflict between a cognitive approach uh, and a verbal approach to understanding the religion you're doing and an effort to try to create a more experiential, or as Jindo said, a, an ontological ex, uh, approach uh, is, is, uh, is very interesting to me. I don't fully grasp it, but I, I do sense it. And um, uh, sometimes uh, you, you do, like a, like, like a musician, you do find yourself in a zone. I'm not sure whether the zone is moving you closer to some sort of uh, mini awakening, but it is a special experience. It's something special out of the ordinary, out of the ordinary day-to-day -day mundane way we exist. And now at places like Johns Hopkins Medical School, they're experimenting with psychedelics for the possible use in, in treating uh, uh, people with mental and emotional illnesses. And I'm really wondering whether we are headed down the road of maybe using outside agents to transform ourselves spiritually. And uh, all of this interests me. I'm somewhat concerned about its implications. But in my own spiritual path, I do wonder whether I should be focusing more on ritual and mikyo than on uh, than, than uh, being more of a nightstand Buddha reading books about a Buddhist reading books about it. That's just a comment I wanted to make. And I don't know whether that fits with what you were teaching about some me too, but uh, those are just some of my observations. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, you know, it, it's so funny that you say um, the Catholic churches because some of my most meaningful experiences in Catholic churches are the dead silence when when walking in outside of mass 
and and the silence is actually what speaks to me more um, in those moments. But I think it, it, you know it does bring up um, a more interesting point, which is to say that this is not the way, but a way. Um, and so for for any given person, um, it may be whatever allows for that experience that helps to broaden one's perspective. Can I poo poo it if it's if it is part of Hangoku in and of itself? If it is part of the Dharmakaya, then you know. Um, obviously, we may may on a mundane level talk about whether psychedelics are actually helpful or not. But you know, for some people, it has proven to be so. But whether for me or not, <laughs> that's a that's a whole other conversation. Um, let's see. I just wanted to make sure. Then Glenn has his hands up. Oh, I see a whole bunch of other hands. Um, John, you had your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to thank you, Koshin, for this presentation. Uh, you provoked a thoughtful and meaningful discussion. I've enjoyed that as well. Thank you. Great. And Mushin? Yeah, I was wondering, Dainichi Nurai, uh, the root Buddha for all the other Buddhas, doesn't show up on, in, as images in, in our temple other than in the Taizakai. Mm -hmm. In Kongokai, yeah. I'm wondering how come. Well, I, I should probably answer yeah, that. Please. Well, the reason is because, you know, for instance, the largest temple in Japan, I think it's, no, it's not the largest temple in Japan. It's the oldest temple in Japan. Um, I'm forgetting the name in, in Nara. Oh, yeah. I've uh, been. Uh, that Dainichi Nyorai is the, is right. the main name in that temple. Yes. And there's many temples that do have Dainichi Nyorai or Mahavairachana as the single image. But there's a lot of temples that have only Amida. There's another temple, a bunch of temples, especially Tendai, that are more likely to have um, the medicine Buddha, Yakshi Nyorai. It really is a matter of what does that temple want to use as its primary image. Some temples use an esoteric image such as as Fudo Myo as a primary image. And you're not gonna find any of those other Buddhas. So ours was an active choice of Kanabasatsu, compassion, Yachinurai healing, and Bishamonten protection. So there's no reason to bring in Dainichi Nyurai. Dainichi Nyurai is already on the is already on the Taizukai and Kongo yeah. And and from an esoteric perspective, um, all all the other Buddhas um, are uh, avenues towards. And so, um, if uh, if we're looking at the unification towards uh, Yakshi Nyorai, for example, um, the the theory would state that by unifying with Yakshi Nyorai, you're actually also unifying with that Yakshi Nyorai. If if from a, from an esoteric perspective, but right. It's, um, any other kind of quick? Uh, oh, Ralph, yes. Um, yeah, the Monchin, you made a comment uh, uh, a little bit ago, uh, uh, and that was the quote unquote a shortcut uh, right. to enlightenment. Um, and that uh, grabbed me a little bit because I remember hearing that or being told that about tantric Buddhism. Tantric Buddhism is esoteric. It's esoteric. Yes, I understood that. They're, 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 but you're thinking of tantric in terms of the sexual practices and that sort of thing, I assume. No, no, I'm okay. thinking of it in terms of the because mantras and the esoteric uh, practices and it being a, a, a quote unquote shortcut. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, um, and, and, and that goes back to what, to specifically what uh, Koshin was talking about with Sanmitsu. Yes. So it's the unification and it's an attempt by the practitioner, whether one is doing it as an esoteric practice or as a lay practitioner, you're doing it, you're trying to cut through the stuff that gets in the way, the hindrances that get in the way of our achieving awakening. That's right. what Sanmitsu is. Whether you're okay. doing it in an esoteric practice with physically mudras and mantras by someone who is so trained, or you're doing it in your daily life, so that when we do Om Ahum this evening, doing it fully, and you 
drop away that that provisional self, which becomes really important as, as part of that process. Right. Okay. So there is a relationship then between uh, 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 tantric Buddhism and uh, and uh, the uh... just just different terms for the same thing. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank yep. you. It's a good question. Thank you. Anyone else? Great. Um, we are going to move right along. Um, the Dharma talk for this evening. Um, when I was asked to do this, I was also asked to do the October Shingi. So I'll be the contributor for the meanderings um, for the October Shingi. Uh, and in that, I, I discussed my recent wrestling with choice and how that and what has influenced them in my life. And so when it came to this evening's discussion of the San Mitsu um, and reflecting on, on what role it has played in my own experiences, the two somewhat overlapped. Um, but it's obviously, the San Mitsu is obviously a vast topic, but it is one that I feel personally very strongly about. And having used it in my own practice and those few times um, of at least conceptual understanding uh, have had a tremendous impact. However, there are way more examples of when I was not utilizing it. And it's, and it's only in hindsight that I can recognize that if I had, it might have been more beneficial. Um, however, both the doing and the not doing can be an opportunity to learn. Both require an, obser uh, an observance of what Monshin Sensei referred to last week as wise awareness. If I'm only learning from what I might assume to be as positive experiences, I'm actively foregoing about 90 to 99, 95 to 99% of the rest of my life. Because, you know, dukkha, right. When we inevitably do not act in accordance with the teachings, we should at least know that we could have. We try to see how we could have and work with diligence to do so and be better going forward. In that essence, Sangimon, the repent, it, it, that is the essence of Sangimon in the, in the daily service. Any given situation may not have played out any differently, but that's not the reason to cultivate wise awareness. Life will be what it is. External and, yes, internal forces will always be at play. And it, and it would be presumptuous to think that we will always know what is best, how to act, react, interact. And what then is the right choice? There is a whole lot of gray in a lot of this. As much as we um, might find solace in black or white, gray is most of what there is swinging between both sides of that pendulum. We, treat, we achieve something or we don't. We are kind or we aren't. There is hope or there isn't. Jubilation, depression, ease, overwhelmed being right, being wrong. Where is the gray? These extremes do not provide a sense of that middle way. When does the pendulum stop? When is it still? How do we find that resting place? If we make a choice to, do, to be and do better in our own lives, we should allow for a lot more gray. We must have the grace and patience with ourselves to best accommodate it so that we can experience what that middle way can be. Being aware of the extremes helps us, helps us know what, how to avoid them. And besides, considering Hongkaku thought, the entire pendulum swing is the Buddha. But, but we have to make the choice to use the Buddha Dharma to learn, grow, and change to actually experience what that is. Aligning body, speech, and mind is a way to get rid of the fog of our unawakened state. Find a way through the gray and help guide our moment-to-moment -moment choices. When you, are all, uh, when you are all here on any given Wednesday night, and thank you so much, I would assume that uh, this time means at least something to you. You're choosing to be here, or at least I hope, because if you're not, then you have to give me some sort of signal and being held against your will or whatever but you are generously giving time to yourself and that of the people here because I hope you believe it can help. However, don't let this be the only chunk of time. And I, and I get that it might just simply be a moment to check in with yourself or tune out from everything else that's going on. And that's fine. 
but let it at least act as a bell of mindfulness. A time to revalidate the choice to live in a purposeful way. It is not an easy way, but nonetheless worthwhile. And you are worth it. The extinction of dukkha, our discontentedness, and that of all other sentient beings is worth it. The more we take the time to drop into a state of wise awareness, the more that veil dissolves, the more the act becomes procedural and, the, and it is becomes more ingrained into who and how we are. As it becomes more prevalent in our lives, the more naturally it occurs, impacting not only ourselves, but all of those around us, our earth and the entire Buddha realm. And in the wise words of who someone I admire very much for all those mashaholics in the world. Colonel Potter coming to us again. It is too big of a world to be in competition with everybody else. The only guy I have to get better than is who I am right now.